takes a second to get done. So um, Data Gale today, we've got Will Parkinson from Earth Daily, talk, Daily talking to us about um, uh, Sentinel-2 mosaics and some satellite imagery processing. So take it away, Will. OK, sounds good. Thank you, James. Uh, so hello, everyone. I'm Will Parkinson. I'm a technical product manager at Earth Daily Analytics. Um, before I jump into the to the slideshow itself, um, I'm going to give a bit of a presentation as well as a, a little bit of sort of visual demos of looking at the data. Uh, and then ideally, I want to open this up at the end for a bit more of an open-ended discussion, uh, really revolving around how to interface with data and what kind of makes a more seamless interaction with data of this type. Uh, but to start, uh, my background, uh, I'm a remote sensing scientist by trade. I've been in this world of geomatics and remote sensing for my entire career. Uh, years ago, I used to work for the government, so I've done lots of different government type work from digitizing maps for the geologic survey to developing new machine learning models for Agricultural Canada to working at Canadian Centre Remote Sensing on some research to now where I am now. So I've, I've kind of journeyed well throughout this sort of remote sensing and geomatics processing domain. Um, at Earth Daily Analytics, I've spent time in the research group, the engineering group, and now I spend most of my time really just focusing on the products we make and ensuring that they are usable for our customers. Uh, and that has lots of different contexts, such as the customers you're working with, what level of sophistication they have, what is their existing processing pipeline or lack thereof look like. All these sorts of questions really roll into that. As you here, I'm sure, are very aware of working with customers a little bit more directly and a little bit more hands-on than I typically do. The last thing I'll say before I jump in, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I may not be able to see you as I'm doing this on this. So if you want to just jump in and ask a question on a slide, I have no problem if you just unmute and jump in and say, hey, I have a question. Um, you can wait to the end as well, but I have, I have no worries about that. Uh, and then before I jump in, are we good to start? Uh, any questions or anything else? OK, OK, here we go. Let's see if this all works out here. Sharing screen. Can you see? Yes, we are good. OK. Yes. OK. So I'm going to back up a little bit and talk a little bit about Earth Daily first, just talk about who we are, what we do. Uh, so we are a software and information services company specializing in satellite data processing and analytics. Uh, we do not call ourselves a space company. We call ourselves an information company that works in space as required. Uh, we also have a subsidiary called Earth Daily Agro, and with them, they bring more than 30 years of experience in agricultural analysis of satellite and weather data for all kinds of crop management support. And so we have kind of two major major initiatives at the moment, and that's, and that's growing. One is the sort of software group around processing data, building data products, and then the other is our agricultural subsidiary. Uh, they work uh, heavily in 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 U.S. as well as France, but they are actually very globally. They have a global footprint. Uh, they have offices in in Brazil, uh, all over Europe, uh, all over parts of Asia, and so on and so forth. So they really do this sort of work all over the world, and and they we use that to to f give feedback on how we produce data and ensure that we're producing data for for our our internal customers, and then we we focus that and then go outward. Uh, we are a vertically integrated company. So we go from the upstream full to the downstream in value add products and services in this remote sensing domain. So on the upstream, we have uh, satellites, the building of satellites and downlinking of that data and, and getting that data uh, to your processing system. We, we do that work. Uh, our core IP is our Earth Pipeline as a Service, which is a fully automated commissioning, image processing, calibration, and quality assurance system for raw satellite data. And that's what that picture on the left is sort of trying to demonstrate, just to make it very clear. As a data provider, when we say raw, we really mean raw. We mean the, the, the piece to part packets in as raw form of satellite data as possible. Um, and the last thing I'll add to that is this, the nature of the data you get when it's in its raw form can be very, very different from sensor to sensor to sensor, which is why they can have very long sort of commissioning phases and things like this. Uh, our Earth Pipeline as a Service has all that sort of built into this nice modern architecture, cloud native system that does commissioning, does processing, does calibration, and all does this on the cloud. That's kind of core to what our, our, our technology is. And then the downstream, we also do value-add services. That was 
the uh, Earth Daily Agro reference I had made. We, we, we provide direct analytics to customers. This includes farming recommendations all the way up to sort of commodity understanding of the global markets and things like this. And through our, our work over the years in remote sensing uh, and, and, and fundamentally monitoring the environment, monitoring the environment for change in agricultural spaces, um, we're seeing this growing and pressing need for monitoring, which is sort of interesting when you look at the amount of data providers that have sort of continually grown and gone up. We have this increasing amount of data availability, yet there's still this missing point around how do we understand our landscape and understand how our landscape is changing at scale and over time. And this is really informing the build of our Earth Daily Constellation. And so what we see is that many of the greatest challenges for the world um, are require this high cadence, scientific quality, AI-derived monitoring, change detection, alerting, and predictive analytics at scale, which is all really to say we need to get better at machine to machine interpretation of satellite data so that we can build more robust change detection systems. And we should be able to do that at large, large scales. We're thinking, you know, provinces to countries and things like this. We need to be able to focus our resources where they need to be. And the best way to do that is to sort of know where things are changing in real time. Uh, this sort of regular monitoring, if it can be done in a cost effective way, can support all kinds of different industries. We're really focused on monitoring the environment at scale over time. So food security, water optimization, climate change, carbon trading, deforestation, habitat protection, the whole ESG reporting and corporate accountability space itself, um, disaster response, and of course, the standard remote sensing national and allied security. Uh, we believe the, all these fit this very well um, if, if that mission was built to that purpose. And so, that's sort of the, the initial problem that we start out with, just talking about data. Um, the current data misses the mark on coverage monitoring. That's sort of the assertion we're, that I'll make here. And, and the solution to that is fundamentally more data, but more data that's specifically tailored to that purpose. And, and what I mean by that is there are great scientific missions right now. Sentinel-2 is a great one, one that I'm gonna talk about ad nauseum in, in the Mosaic context, but it's not enough data. Landsat, same case. And, and, and again, it's scientific quality, but it's not quite enough data. We always have this problem of imaging the right data at the right time, hoping and praying we don't have clouds and then waiting another couple of days, so on and so forth. So one part is just more imaging acquisitions repeatedly. And then the second part is, are, are we taking the right measurements? And so we're building the Earth Daily Constellation. Uh, this is being built now. Uh, it's targeted for launch uh, late next year, I believe. And it's going to be 10 satellites. They're based on the Airbus from Airbus. These are big satellites. These are not small, small little satellites. These are sort of fully, fully specced out satellites. They're going to have 22 spectral bands, uh, 11 in the vis near, six swear bands, and five thermal bands. Uh, I, I, it'll be a whole deeper sort of hour-long discussion of that constellation and, and the details therein, and I, I'm happy to give that talk, but that'll be another one. But it suffice it to say we're building this super spectral system that is really focused on monitoring the environment. Uh, we're making the trade space to get as many spectral channels that make sense for us to include to that end. Um, and, and you'll see even in that space, we have different uh, GSDs depending on the sensors in question here as well, because just based on the technology and availability, uh, you know, you can't measure thermal at five meters as much as some people would love to. Um, the last thing I'll say is the whole goal of this is the Earth Daily Constellation is a daily acquisition of the Earth's landmass every day. So it's all of these bands over all of the Earth's landmass every day, pushing that imaging opportunity. And the last part I'll say about this is the core to that as well is there's no competition for acquisition. This is an always on systemic collection. Um, it will collect every day. It will continue to collect every day until the end of life. And, and there's no sort of competition for that data. And this is what we're focusing on. We, we see this every day. I'm sure you see this in your business as well. Um, the interest in the broad environmental impact of business and environment is growing across every industry I've talked to, whether we're talking the sort of obvious examples of, you know, forests and, and mining and, and corporate ESG to some less obvious ones like 
uh, uh, property management to to insurance and things like this. Everyone is more and more interested in the environment, how the environment is changing, and what what can be done to mitigate those those effects. And the last question, of course, is are the things I've done to mitigate those effects working? Um, and all of these questions are, are more and more profound, more and more challenging, and requiring a, a, a pool of people that know how to work with Earth observation data more and more in all directions. So that's sort of the data problem. I'm going to ignore that basically for the rest of this talk, which, which is just to say, you know, Earth Daily is building this constellation to solve this data problem as we understand it. That's sort of part one. Uh, part two is how do users access data? Um, this is something uh, Spark Geo knows much better than even myself. Uh, this is one of the reasons we collaborated together on Earth Data Store, which is that super cluster project we worked on, which is the Earth Data Store. One core aspect of that was the whole stack standard and using spatial temporal asset catalogs to search and query data. Uh, the second part of that, which is really, again, core to what we do well, is making harmonizing data both geometrically uh, and radiometrically. And so we would bring data into Earth Data Store. Uh, all of that data would be cataloged using stack uh, standards, but we would also refine that data. We would, we would adjust the geometry, we would adjust the radiometry, and we would make that data balanced uh, for analysis right out of the gate. And the, and the example we, we did for that in the Earth Data Store uh, was actually for our subsidiary. So one example of that is uh, the Cebras 4 satellite, which has really great and extensive coverage over the Brazil region, but its geometric accuracy can shift a bit, a bit depending on the acquisition in question. And so what our Earth Data Store system would do is, is basically look for all Cebras 4 data that's published, and then if it, it does get published and it's over an area of interest for us, we would automatically uh, refine that data product in our system and then deliver it to our customers, in this case, our internal customers, um, so that they could drive ag agriculture analytics on it. So this is just a, a little brief example of what that, that image, a single image within the Earth Data Store meant. So we had this capacity where we could index and, inf and refine and sort of make sure that the fire hose of data you're being fed is good. Uh, but there's still a second problem to that, which is, you know, how do I now handle this fire hose of data? We can refine the data, we can make that data geometrically consistent, we can calibrate that data, but that doesn't really solve the cloud problem. It doesn't really solve the sort of volume of data that I need to process problem. It doesn't really solve if I'm sort of asking these larger, larger questions, what pixels do I even pay attention to within a given, say, week of measurements or even month of measurements? It, it, it has these other sorts of challenges. Now, sometimes that's fine. For example, if I want a really dense time series and I'm doing a time series based analysis, that's not the same question. But if I'm trying to say, how much has my forest in all of Alberta changed in the years of 2019 to 2020, that's a sort of different question and different frame that requires a different uh, uh, molding of the data to the answer those types of questions. Which is why we started building another supercluster project, which is satellite-based environmental analytics, uh, or what we also call analysis-ready mosaics. And that's what this project here starts to represent. And so we leverage all that work in the Earth Data Store around, around the indexing and, and looking for data and even improving data where, where we need to. And we use all that technology to refine and build these, these analysis-ready mosaic products. And, and that's just really about bringing heaps of data together, refining that, and, and trying to build these nice cloud-free mosaics that are still uh, quantitatively useful rather than just, say, visually useful. And that's what we've been doing. Uh, we've been doing that for over a year and a bit now, uh, mostly with Sentinel data products. And the reason for Sentinel is, is just uh, existing compatibility with the Earth Data Store system and indexing and things like this. Uh, we're already working on additional sensors and working towards multi-sensor mosaics now. But what we're really building a lot of this technology for is in preparation for the constellation itself. We want to be ready out of the gate to build these large area analysis ready mosaics uh, as soon as our constellation is launched and calibrated and, and operational. So that we can be in a position that we can have these high quality quantitative products that are synoptic of landscapes on, say, monthly timescales, things like this, so that users can just say, give me that, 
region, give me over this month, and, and feed it right into their machine learning algorithms. Which brings us to the sort of core part of what I wanted to talk today, which is just analysis ready mosaics. I'll uh, pause here for a quick second because I kind of threw a bunch of concepts out there for, for a second and see if there's any questions. I have a question. Yeah. Um, how does the work you're doing compare with the harmonized uh, Sentinel Lance app that's going on at NASA? Is it kind of similar? Or... Great question. Um, it's similar. Um, it's similar in that they've done a lot of work to sort of build that harmonized, refined data set. Uh, it's different in that, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a bit, it's different in that we're a little bit more custom in how we're approaching the problem. Uh, what we've learned in our time in the market with this with this product is lot, some users really do want mosaics, but lots of, our, of the sophisticated users that want to do quantitative analysis uh, often are building their own mosaics because they have their own decision sets they want to make for their application. Um, that's not to say there's sort of an endless amount of customization, but there's there's certainly small tweaks that some people are interested in. I, I'll, I'll give you a basic example. Um, lots of a common lots of common criteria for mosaics might be something like peak of NDVI, sort of a peak of growth season. Another one some people want for a very different use case could be a, a bare bare earth mosaic. So get me a mosaic before all the leaves come out. Um, that's so, sort of two extremes, but I think that's sort of a good example of how we're trying to approach this a little differently. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and that sort of is a great question because it, it hints into this a little bit. So mosaics of various types. Um, all, you, you are all practitioners here. You've seen mosaics before. You've seen the tools that make mosaics. Most commercial software in this space of geomatics and remote sensing has a mosaicing option. You know, I can go right into command line and say, and merge a bunch of data sets using GDAL. So what are we really doing with mosaics? We have mosaics as a sort of tool and concept, but, but there's a massive gradient between just running the tools and trying to run the tools to, to the purpose that we're looking at. Uh, and so, I, I put this slide up just to, just to really reiterate that. We're talking about analysis ready mosaics, which are in themselves complex, costly produced, and specifically designed to feed into machine learning applications. So what do we mean by designed to feed into machine learning applications? Um, at its core, it's about data refinement. Uh, like I had been saying in the past, I've spent various parts of my career in, in various capacities, but when I, when I have spent a lot of time doing machine learning, so much of my effort was always around feeding it and curating the data uh, in, in such a way that it could be used easily by the algorithm. Now, some of that is, is just like, is my data good? But a lot of that is just ancillary data, right? Where is the data I want to ignore? Where is, where is the cloudy data? Where is the bad data? Where is the data that we couldn't, uh, that couldn't be corrected enough under the sort of very narrow time range or other sets of criteria that we made to build the product? And so, so in our worldview, to be machine learning capable is a few things. One is you need to get the data without humans in the loop, right? You need to be able to order that data, get that data via API, and, and understand what that data means without, without humans or phone calls or emails saying, I need that sort of product. And then the second part is once, once you're able to get that data without humans is, can I use a, a series of heuristics such as masks or other annotations to just get that data as refined and as shaped as, as, as quickly as possible as what I need for my machine learning models? Um, and the last part of this, which I hope to talk a little bit about later, is what is the best starting point for that question? And I think this is sort of an interesting open one all the time. Um, lots, of, lots of users choose tiling schemes for data. Lots of users choose um, various sort of relational database systems for data. Um, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit later as well. So for us, um, analysis writing mosaics really is really about compatibility. So we have annotations, uh, basic ones, you know, clouds, cloud shadow, water, snow, uh, data provenance, every measure needs to be traceable to a source, right? So if you're solving problems for customers and you can't answer where that pixel comes from or when it was taken, it's, it seemed, it, it's going to be a tough conversation to have. Uh, you need radiometric or color consistency. You need geometric or location consistency. 
Uh, you need temporal coherence, and, and we're highlighting this as specifically to a custom date range. And this is because, again, questions are often answered to a specific purpose. If I know I'm looking at a very specific set of fires, uh, for example, and I want to map how severe those fires were, I, I tend to know when the fires started, and so I, I often will want a baseline map that's as close to that as possible, for example. And finally, uh, as, a, as a big difference between us and many other systems uh, is, is quality assurance. Um, there are automated mosaicing tools out there at varying degrees of quality, but the biggest challenge is that, is that quality consistency. And so what we really wrap in our, in, our, in our system is to assure that the data coming out is quality assured, and we have lots of tools that, that we use to make sure that our data is very high quality and, and we, we leverage them wherever possible. So some of this is straightforward. Uh, you've seen this stuff before, so I'm just going to fly through this, and I'm also going to do a little bit more of a live example of the, I think something very similar to this picture. So you know we have we have annotated masks. Um, you can take every pixel and trace it back to its source. Again, that matters for for understanding where your measurements come from. Um, I want to just pause here a little bit just to talk about geometry and why it really really does matter. Um, so this example here is from Sentinel only Sentinel data. We get Sentinel 2A and B over a very sort of small little area in northern BC uh, with the original ones on the left and looping in the time series and the corrected ones on the right. And these are just sort of, these are just relatively minor shifts in the grand scheme of things here, but they start to play a big role as we, as we throw images together more and more and more. And so what we do within our mosaicing software is, is we do a, a bulk refinement of our geometry. Um, and, and so we take, we take exhaustive measurements of, of the geometric characteristics of all of the products we're putting into the system, and, and we correct all of them so that they are aligned with each other in a highly consistent way. And this matters as you start to construct mosaics, because if you don't do that, there's a sort of fidelity you lose in the mosaic products themselves. And this, and this is one of the hardest types of, of image artifacts to really see and tease out of imagery easily. Um, I'm not sure if it's easy to see on this particular screen share because we're talking about the sort of fuzziness that's a little bit tricky. It's most visible, I find, on, on the waterways here where you can really see that blurriness of the waterways. Any sort of edge starts to get lost. And this is what happens when you build mosaics in, in without a sort of rigorous look at the geometry and what happens. Now, there's lots of ways you can fix geometry. Um, so I'm not going to dive into the sort of methods of correction, but it suffice it to say a sort of bulk examination matters a lot. Uh, the more obvious stuff we see in mosaics is just the, the radiometric correction. Some of this is easier um, than others. Uh, so, for example, understanding where your, your big white popcorn puffy clouds are is not too hard. Uh, seasonal effects can be a really big challenge because, especially if we're talking about large geographies, northern areas of the same mosaic might have snow while southern areas don't. So there's lots of considerations there. Um, you can get standard just seam lines at sort of local and broad levels. So on the left, this is just a standard sort of artifact you see from any sort of two image acquisitions. And on the right is a much more systematic one. This is over a region of Brazil where you just see those nice uh, stripes from the, from the image swaths. All of these things make their ways into mosaics. These are screenshots from mosaics. And, and so when you're talking about radiometry, you're talking about really managing all of this uh, data and all of this and correcting it to make that harmonized data product. And again, I'm not going to dive deep into the methods to get you there, but you, you do operate these sort of corrections at various scales. You're going to operate them at the sort of local scale of correcting your local radiometry as well as the broader radiometric effects across the whole image. So I'm going to pause here. I'm just going to do some data uh, exploration here using the Australia fires on the mosaic we had. Just give me one second because I have to get my browser ready here. Peter froze. Peter froze. There we go. Come on. There we go. Right. Good. Okay. Uh, can you see this uh, Eastern Australia image? Yes. Okay. 
Uh, so this image is, okay. So this is nothing too exciting yet so far. This is a 2018 autumn image of the Eastern Australia region here. Uh, we're looking at a, a shortwave infrared composite. So that's uh, band 12, band 8A, and band 4 right now. Um, so we're near infrared and red, I believe, top of my head. Um, not going to dive too deep into image interpretation here, but suffice it to say, uh, I'm I'm using this to highlight uh, the a few kind of nice consistencies and color consistencies in here. So, um, firstly, these are cloud optimized geotiffs that we produce. Uh, so when we make mosaics, we make these files fit to purpose for for customers, and so they can often be be clipped to specific areas of interest or or investigations of interest. But they are cloud optimized, which is why I'm able to sort of load them up in this browser relatively quickly. Um, we're just talking direct to these objects on in, in S3, and then we have a tiler uh, that's lambda back that is serving all this up in real time. And so they're sort of somewhat lightweight and easy to use if you have those those core tool sets in, uh, to use them. Um, but what I'll do now is so we have this nice nice mosaic here, and the whole purpose of these mosaics is really about looking at change. So I'll just do one quick change here. I'm going to skip forward a year. Just give me one second to does 1920, um, the more notable one we heard about in that era. Da, 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 da. Just one second. Oh. There we go. So, uh, so for this one, we're looking one more year ahead. Uh, before we were looking at 2018 on the left, 2019 on the right. Now we're looking at 2019 on the left and 2020 on the right. Again, both of these are in autumn time frame. Uh, and in 2000, and in this time frame, we did see big fires in this region of Australia, uh, and, and that becomes very apparent in this image here. And so, as we look to these more forested regions, we see these nice big red fire scars. Um, and again, this isn't anything new for you. Um, I even have another slide that references the great work you guys do, even in referencing fires and things like this. But so the, so the real take home here is, is, is just really that consistency of measurement across these larger areas. These are, these are big areas we're measuring. And now you can sort of understand these impacts at a larger scale. And you can start to quantify those impacts at a larger scale. And that's what, where, where the advantage of these sort of big mosaics really come, come in. Uh, you're no longer processing individual images. You're often processing this sort of big collective set of these large uh, quantitative data products. And then the next to show you is all of these, again, are only as useful as they're ancillary a lot of the time. And so uh, here's another one here. Um, so this one is a little bit earlier. This is a 2016 uh, image. So going back in time, less data is often available. Uh, so you see clouds are in this mosaic. Uh, this goes back to that custom aspect. We build mosaics to our customers' needs. Uh, and in this particular instance, the decision was made to keep the clouds um, based on a number of other considerations and criteria. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, that Sometimes that makes sense. If you don't have any other data, you can include. Um, but you quickly need to be able to understand where to exclude data and otherwise. And that's where these masks start to come in. So this cloud shadow water mask is what's really purpose fit to purpose for. So all of these come together so that you can just ignore those pixels for your analysis. And then the last one to show you. Is the source masking. Um, which isn't overly uh, interesting, except for when you need to know where your pixels come from. And that's what this represents here on the right. Um, I've just done a very dumb color mapping uh, using, using uh, a, a random RGB mapping of the same band. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about what, how these look in the metadata in a little bit. But this is sort of how this starts to manifest. So you know, depending on the clarity of the image, the quality of the individual image, different decisions get made. Um, these look fully solid. They might not be if we were actually looking a little deeper in the data. This could just be a function of the scale I'm using to look at them. Um, but the point is, each pixel has become traceable within this structure.
Da, da, da. Was there anything else? Uh, and the last thing I'll, I'll show you, which is um, just a little bit further along, uh, and I'll do it in false color. Well, let's see here. Uh, so this one is, is just looking at the recovery. Um, so on the left now, we have the sort of big bluish areas now um, showing up very dominantly uh, where the fires were, or at least likely fires were. I'm not going to necessarily say every change is a fire in this context. Uh, and then you can also continue this sort of monitoring to understand the rate and, and speed of recovery. Uh, and those who do fire analysis, and I'm sure there could be people here who do that, um, a lot of that does center around things like burn severity and, and, and other factors around the nature of the fire itself. And so understanding not just where the fires were, the extent of the fires, but the nature of recovery and speed of recovery. All of these things start to matter holistically. All of these things form why and how you build mosaics um, and are all viable within this sort of large mosaic structure. And I'm going to pause here for a second. There it is. Because I think, is there any questions? Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay. So it's all about consistency, right? Mosaics are all about just data refinement. At the end of the day, whether we're talking in data refinement or data reduction, things like principal component analysis, I don't view like principal component analysis, sorry, sorry. I don't view mosaics as overly different from that. I view mosaics as just a data refinement tool so that I can ask my questions in a much easier way. Um, obviously I can't ask all questions that way, but I can ask very specific questions that way. This one's an easy one, you know, where are the obvious clear cuts, but then more subtle ones could be, you know, where are we seeing green up from clear cuts? How are these clear cuts behaving over a five year span compared to other similar ones, right? You can start to ask these sort of scale questions quite easily. And what you'll see in this and in the next one I'll show you, uh, there is very, very little shift between these two images you're seeing in this swipe, right? There, this is a fully sub pixel accuracy. And the only thing you're really seeing changes are real changes. And that's the important thing here is that changes are real. They're not just changes in data and data quality. Um, again, just another example. Again, we have a nice river, river morphology example here, but again, uh, the landscape itself is not changing where there is no change, right? We're not getting any sort of spatial shift and we're getting very little color shift. And when we get that and we combine all those things together, we can start to ask more interesting questions, right? We can start to ask uh, how things are behaving over time. Um, if any of you are on uh, our website and look at uh, our one of our mosaic blogs, this is a, a couple pictures from it and I'll bet to share a video from it as well. Um, all it's really doing is taking that concept in a, in a very dumbish way by looking at the NDVI over a sort of six year time span. Um, but then just looking at the trend of that. And the trend of that has value, right? It tells us about how the peak of vegetation within that understood month range is changing over time. Uh, and there's other benefits of, of bringing all that data together for the same reason. So again, this is just another video. This is just highlighting, again, that spatial shift. Um, this is from that post as well. Um, and so we're just looping through all the summer seasons from 2016 to 2021. Uh, and what we're really just highlighting here is that the features on the landscape aren't changing again, except for ch where changes are. Um, it does a very good job of, of holding those shorelines consistent, even with the water falling. So that sort of speaks wonders to our geometric correction algorithm. Um, and again, you can just really quantify these things. And that is sort of at the core of this whole challenge, right? We have your data quality, your data has to be good, it has to be annotated, and it has to mean something in time, right? It's not enough to just have a mosaic. The mosaic has to mean something specifically. For example, this is the sort of autumn range of this year. This is the spring range of this year. If we combine both of those, that can tell us a lot about the nature of green up, the nature of the different plants, and potentially even uh, be able to tell the difference between plants because their phenological cycles are different. And so you can combine mosaics with that other understanding as well, depending again on what you're trying to do. Um, and, and why does that matter? I've hinted at this a bit. It's, it's all about cumulative effects. Uh, there was a great one that you guys did at Spark Geo, I think it was only a week ago or a couple of days ago, 
around wildfires and flooding. And I think that's a great example because what, what we see in the natural environment all the time is all of these things are interrelated. Now, is there always a direct cause and effect on, you know, if this happens and that happens? Well, sometimes, but often not. These are complicated systems with complicated processes in them. But understanding those processes and bringing this sort of data to bear with understanding those processes helps uh, a broader context. And this idea of cumulative effects is not mine. Um, I stole this from, I believe it was CCMEO and some of their concepts around data cubes, which is all just really to say, if we take really good curated earth observation data and mix that with really good curated environmental data, and we do that over time, we can start to ask more interesting time-based questions. But a core to that is really image mosaics over time and then modeling that over time and then trying to form those relationships. And so the mosaics that people want to use are very different. Um, they're asking different questions with them. They're asking often, uh, you know, your, your straightforward ones are things like land cover. Your more specific and acute ones could be things like fire and fire scars or river morphology changes or just understanding land use change. Um, lots of people just want mosaics so they can load them into a GIS and annotate their own changes too. It's anything and everything in between. And so uh, for us, it's the, the, the first letter, the first six letters in customer, custom is really king to this sort of value proposition. Um, users want mosaics and they have the reason, their reasons for them. Um, few examples on the left around fit to purpose. Uh, measurements need to be meaningful. And most importantly, your, your data has to be quality assured. Um, and there's lots of ways you get there. So for us, you know, we have feedstock products that are quality controlled using weighted availability. So we, we actually have a, a robust examination of all the data coming into the mosaicing system. And then we do a robust examination on the tail end. In principle, we try to minimize as much garbage going in as possible. And then, and then we also QA to see if any garbage did sneak in. And one core part of, of mosaics is these can be a little timely to produce. And when I say timely, I'm talking, you know, hours, days. Um, so what we do is also deliver uh, preview mosaics to our customers. And so that can look something like a customer comes to us and says, you know, I have this area of interest, this time of interest. I'm looking at this sort of signal in the landscape. Let's call it for the argument peak max NDVI. Um, and we'll, we'll generate preview mosaics that we send back to the customers often at reduced resolutions, things like this, uh, to say, you know, these are your criteria. Uh, we think these data challenges will be a problem. We should probably make these adjustments or allow some of these data sets in. So there's a, it's, not a, it's not always a, a obvious um, answer to these problems, um, but that's why we have this sort of preview loop, which allows customers also to refine their request, right? Um, it's not uncommon when users are building mosaics, they sort of set out with an ambitious time frame. They can't produce the data they want. Maybe they'll adjust the time frame a little bit and see if they get just enough data because you're always sort of playing that data game. Uh, and so we want to build this system to work within that. And that matters because when you're doing work like this, that little decision can have a big impact on your final data that comes out. So this is just a nice, very basic example here. Um, this was one we were making. This is in the Kootenai regions of BC, I believe. Um, it's a little bit tilted, so it may look off uh, to those who know the region. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the, the, the point of this part here is to talk about a mosaic we produced and our, our specification we were given to spec uh, was quite narrow. It was, it was sort of this uh, 2019, 515 was our cutoff. And then 2019, 701 was our cutoff. So this nice little narrow range here. Um, very ambitious to try and build a mosaic in spring with such a narrow range, especially over that sort of coverage. Uh, and so when we were able to make it to spec, that's the one on the right. You see that's how it's sort of nicely constrained. Bad data makes it through, right? We have this nice lots of cloud artifacts coming through. Uh, but if you're able to make a, a slightly more fuzzy logic in how you bring data in, Maybe you're bringing data in you're not as happy about bringing in, but at least it's data you can measure and you can sort of balance the other data products. This is what we mean by we talk about best measures. And this is what we mean when we talk about the purpose of previews. Um, users want data they can use, and they, want to, they often want that quick loop to know that they're sort of asking the right questions, or in, in many cases, paying for data they want to use. 
So analysis rating mosaics are made using handfuls of thousands of image products under different conditions. This includes time of acquisition, atmosphere, plant growth cycles, cumulative precipitations, moisture regimes. They have to account for location discrepancies, dynamic atmospheric gases, measurements of artifacts such as clouds, measurement differences not otherwise managed. Um, and they're often generally constrained by quality of input data and the available input data. Um, and so we were really just playing this, this complicated quality game, this complicated uh, uh, data correction game, and you're always limited by the data you have available. Um, and so that's, that's really how that, those all come together. So the last thing I want to talk about, and then we can just sort of open this up a little bit more, uh, is to talk about how we package up our data products a little bit. So uh, we package our data products as cloud-optimized geotiffs, uh, but we often package them to purpose of AOI. So we have no complicated sort of tiling or serving system that we use at the moment. Um, we, we deliver our products via object stores um, and we can make available those products in two different ways. One is sort of uh, direct to an object store uh, and then the other is through a signed URL um, of those same links. The, and then we serve up all that data, all the metadata, sorry, uh, using JSON standards. So we only really serve, we have two main ones. One is the sort of main metadata component and one is basically a lookup table to that source mask. So it's just, you know, values of one or this, values of two or this, sort of mapping to the original Sentinel data. So for that, the last thing I'll share here is, um, on our website, if you go to our Earth Mosaics now in beta and you register to access preview, um, any of you can register to do this. Uh, when you do log in and register for that, you get access to just two mosaics, our 2019 and 2020 summer mosaics. Um, they're served up in this interface you see here. Um, within this interface, you can just browse around and look at the data, evaluate it. You can't look too deeply past uh, into the masks or the data masks or anything like that. Um, and you can't access all of the metadata for analysis, but you can also download these products. So these ones here, you can directly download them, work with them yourself. Uh, and then the last thing we provide in a very, very basic way uh, is, is just a very basic access example. Um, and what that looks like is this here. Uh, and then within, it, within the access example, what you do is you can copy these URLs, which just gives you a signed HTTPS link. Um, you can paste that link in here and, and it just gives you a quick example of accessing data in that sort of COG-like environment. I'm not gonna go over this. I'm sure a lot of you know about how to access COG, so I'm not gonna belabor it, but this is sort of how we just package all these things together. Um, and the last part is, da, 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 let's find it. Uh, those two, the two metadata files I had alluded to. So these are stack files. Um, you've seen this type of structure before, so I'm not gonna go into too big. We try to keep it pretty lightweight on what's in here. Um, just very key to the core components, but we do list the data sources. We do list um, where things come from, what the other assets are. Uh, and within our mosaic lookup table or source metadata, this is how this, this looks here. We, we mapped the individual integers and then back to those uh, particular products. So that brings us to the, about the end of the sort of core part I was presenting here. Um, which is really just centered on accessing this data. So now we're in this state now where you know, we can produce these really high quality data products. We can serve these products up in these very lightweight ways should we see fit. Some of our customers really like that. Um, some of our customers have their own processing pipelines, so they don't want us to do much to make sure their data is ready to be served. They would rather us hand them a, a multi hundred gigabyte file that is good than say, you know, here's a folder structure that's been tiled for you, et cetera. And so I wanted to use this opportunity to talk to all of you um, who are much more experienced practitioners with a diverse set of customers at various degrees of sophistication um, and, and take your opinions. What, what would make Mosaic products easier for you to use? Um, is, it, is it all about searchability? Is it all about format? Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm open to any ideas anyone has here for thoughts. Um, yeah, cool. Thanks, Will. That was an awesome talk. Um, does anyone have any input for Will's open question there? Uh, 
doesn't sound like it will, but we could probably follow up on those. I'll, I'll go around. <laughs> I'll, I'll collect some input. Yeah, maybe people are still on their first copy or something. I'm, yeah, I'm sure there's fair. a lot of uh, opinions around the room there for sure. Um, that's fair. But going the other way, does anyone have any questions for Will? Yeah, any questions, thoughts, comments, nasty remarks? I'll take them all. <laughs> Hey, uh, yeah, very, very interesting talk. Well, um, I guess I'm just curious <clears throat> with the, uh, and maybe you covered this, if so, I apologize, but um, with putting these mosaics together, since often they're so custom, like how much, I guess, manual work do you, do you find you have to do to put together one of these things? It's a good question. Um, I would say with every mosaic we've produced, our amount of manual work decreases. So we strive, we strive to be fully automated. Uh, and, and the way we build all of our systems and software systems is to sort of, you know, build, build the, the minimum viable product first and sort of continually improve it. So to the quick answer to your question is there are parts of the system that can be time consuming, but with every mosaic, it's much better. The hardest part for most users that I've seen to date is either A, curating the feedstock data that comes in. Um, the standard metadata that Sentinel tends to ship with is a little bit inadequate to, to be able to just filter using the existing publishing. Uh, if you if you don't do that, then you can get very complicated in your in your what I'd call just pixel composition. Um, I've seen very very complicated heuristics that get used in pixel selection, which are really accounting for bad data coming in. Um, and those are the sort of two core areas, and they're sort of related, right? If you have great data coming in, you could probably not be as sophisticated on how you process it, but if so on and so forth. So um, the core of it is to be automated. That is the goal. Um, and, and we do some, the bulk of the, the manual work we do right now is in the QA. And again, we're building QA tools all the time to make that faster and faster. Cool. Thanks. A little long winded, but I got there. All good. <laughs> Anybody else with a question for Will? No, I have, I have a bunch, so giving other people an opportunity before I use up the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll start off with one if people can think of something in the meantime. So um, Joe Morrison, who's very opinionated on Twitter, you may have heard some yep. of his posts. Yeah. Yep. So he's in the past said that uh, satellite imagery, there's only really two profitable use cases, which is base maps and defense. Um, so I'm curious, there's, there's an organization such as your own that not only is planning on collecting new data, but also in the analysis and process uh, game. Like, where do you see the growth segments? It's um, a good question. Um, I assert that satellite. I, I would. I assert that that the major growth segments we are going to see right now are in environmental monitoring. But let me qualify what I mean by that. Um, what we see in the market a lot is investor interest in things like risk exposure. And while it's true that the, the backbone of the earth observation industry has, has been military and, and base maps and governments, things like this, um, the interest in understanding situationally what is happening is, is growing in every sector that in, is involved in sort of space and managing assets abroad and broadly. Um, I'll give a, I'll give a very specific example that just sort of pushes against that that saying only base maps <laughs> and military, right? Um, not not us, but a company I've I've, I've talked to. Uh, lots of different companies actually do do forest monitoring for forest change. Right, you have you have your big NGO sort of examples with Global Forest Watch, but you also have very specific examples like I'm going to just look at palm plantations. Um, and when you get into specific examples, like I'm looking at palms, 
or I'm looking at softwood lumber or, or whatever the specific question is, people start to care a lot more about what you're producing, right? Um, and so I think to the point of where the value lies, I see a whole world of earth observation applications out there. And the biggest barrier is people knowing that they can use them. Um, and, and, that, and that's not to say, you know, everything is profitable. There, there's certainly an art form in deciding where your earth observation applications are both viable and profitable and, and all those sort of secondary questions. Um, but I think anyone who's really practicing in the field, and, and you at Spark Geo could probably answer this very well as well, you see a diverse and growing group of interest in people solving geospatial problems. And so I question the premise a little bit. I think, I think there's lots of great takes you get out of reading someone like, like him though, because at the same time, a lot of the objections and frictions are real, right? A lot of the frustrations they come from somewhere. And so that's certainly worth reading and understanding where it comes from. I just don't fully agree with it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on the same page. <laughs> I think he likes sound bites a bit too much. Twitter, Twitter worthy posts. Um, yes, yes, they are that. <laughs> to the, to the um, cool, that was a really interesting answer. Um, anyone else with a question? I have another one ready to go, so I'll just go for it. Um, what's the technical level of most customers you deal with? Like you've mentioned a lot of the, you know, you're often delivering basically a satellite image that's been processed ready for ML, but do you go further and actually deliver like insights or is that restricted to the agro business? We are doing research and insights right now. Um, we, we have the ambition to do more value add, uh, the bulk of our, our, the bulk of our efforts by far are in making sure we're ready to produce constellation data that is analysis ready. Um, and that takes up the vast majority of our engineering talent that isn't already making sure we do agriculture analytics right now. We do have a little, a few research projects um, on the go. Um, there's one that we announced a couple days ago uh, in a collaboration with the CSA and a strategic system engineering out of Manitoba, uh, and that's around using earth observation to focus field work around things like harvesting cattails for, for biomass and things like this. So we are playing a little bit in value add spaces, um, but the bulk of our efforts to date are making good data. Um, we are starting the process of expanding into other verticals as well. If you see on our website press releases, you'll see um, we hired a, a guy named James Tanzi, I believe, um, and and he's really core to that sort of ESG space. And that's so we are starting to think about those spaces piece by piece, but it's very strategic at the moment. Cool, thanks. Any more questions? I still have like five. In the list. Another one from me then. How do you right. do cloud? How do you do cloud detection from Sentinel two? Because I know it's challenging. You don't have the thermal band, so it's yeah. Um, there's a few approaches that we've done. Um, I can't dive into all of them. Um, I'll just say that cloud detection is probably a, an area of active research for most organizations that will continue a lot. <laughs> um, we, we have some of our own stuff we do in house. We take the existing Sentinel um, products and sort of augment them a little bit. Um, our, our agricultural subsidiary does a very different set of uh, practices right now for clouds. Uh, they manage clouds a little bit um, more directly while, and we're building, as we always do, build automating tools, automated tools to sort of address them. Um, the quick answer without thermal, though, is you tend to have to bring different approaches together. Yeah. How does it do uh, for uh, snow and ice? My background's in glaciology. And yeah. Is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> snow and ice is a challenge. Snow and ice is a, is a, is a big challenge, for sure. Um, one, of, one of our big things we're excited about with our constellation is exactly that spectral diversity. 
Um, even at the very coarse resolution, we think there's big, big value in taking that coincident measurement for those types of reasons, right? We want to be able to subtract out the stuff we're not interested in. Sometimes that is the snow. Sometimes that isn't the snow. For sure. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. All right, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, anyone with any more questions? Go for it, Jess. Yeah, I'll take one, I guess. Um, so I, I take it from the process, you're you're bringing in all, all this EO data and you're running a whole bunch of algorithms to try and clean up this data. Yep. And, and then you're gonna put it all together in some kind of mosaic based off of the custom needs of your your customer. I'm wondering if 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 there's got, I guess, always some gap in that cleanup that once you go to mosaic, yeah, you, you need to kind of do another round of of adjustment to kind of bring things together. You've kind of got a process where yeah, it's perfect. I just need to slice and dice, put it together, and it's it's all beautiful now. I so it's in the, I like the way you asked that question. I think I think when we're in the current environment, it's more like the former and iterative, like you said. Um, you sort of set out some parameters to generate a mosaic, and often you end up sort of looking at the result and seeing how you can squeeze more lemon juice out of the available lemons you have. I suspect that consideration can change a little bit um, when you have more data, right? If you can, if you are attempting a consistent measurement every day at 1030, you can be, you have much more flexibility to just wait for the next day than you currently do with Sentinel products where you're sort of like, all right, I'm going to use this portion of this image and this portion of this image and this portion of this image and can't really use this at all because there's no imagery data. So I think just by increasing the volume of data attempts, um, that iterativeness will go down. And we see this already, right? If we do a, a, a wider time range of a mosaic or just do it over an area that's, you know, drier and more cloud free, the it's a way less iterative approach already today, right? Our bigger challenges and everyone's bigger challenges is, is in data constriction. Um, and so, yeah, I think that thing happens, but I think it's more of a manifestation of the data limit than anything else. Awesome. Well, uh, that's our time up. So, um, unless anyone else has any pressing last minute questions, um, just going to say thanks, Will. That's great. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, really informative. I'm sure we'll be in touch again. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'm just going to stop recording and uh, let everyone get on to their next meetings and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Have a great day, everyone. You know how to find me. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you know how to find me. Thank Will you. Do. Oh. All right. Thank